Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. Well, as you can see, we're pretty crowded here on set. I wanted to do something a little different for this video. I wanted to sort of look back at uh, how I started astrophotography. I've made videos on it in the past, but uh, there's always new people starting. And uh, I do get questions from time to time. What's the best telescope to use? I'm just starting out. What do you recommend? And obviously there's no you know, clear answer. The, the answer won't be the same for everyone. And we'll discuss that. We'll talk about your, uh, depends on your budget, depends on what you want to focus on, because there's many facets to astrophotography. It's a, quite a large umbrella that many things fit underneath. And uh, yeah, what's, what helped make a decision what's best for you according to your own circumstances and your preferences. So as I know, I won't go into my whole history. We've heard it before. I made a video on it and I've referenced it before. I started with a fairly simple setup. I mean, I didn't go right to just a, a DSLR and a camera lens. I went right to a telescope off the bat. I kind of knew right away that I wanted, I saw pictures on Instagram and I said, wow, that's unbelievable. And I, I saw that people were doing it from locations similar to mine here in Toronto. And I just knew that I wanted to do it. I always loved astronomy and space. And uh, I wanted to get right into taking images. So I went the telescope route. I started with my red cat. I know I often show a picture of it on screen, but here it is in the flesh. I love this little telescope and still use it from time to time, depending on what I'm shooting. It's a great one and one that I'll never get rid of in my collection. But that's where I went. I did a little bit of research and I liked the size. It was small. I knew I could fit it on a small setup like this. And I saw some images taken with it when I was pretty blown away. So I kind of knew that that's the direction I wanted to go out. To be honest, I didn't know much about what kind of telescope it was. I mean, I knew it was a refractor, but um, I didn't know much about it. I just I just kind of read and saw some videos and thought, yeah, that, it looks cool too. And I thought, yeah, that'll work for me. And it wasn't too crazy expensive um, to start with. So that's how I went. But a lot of people that may be a little too expensive, around a thousand dollars for this. For other people, it might be, you know, a little bit too much to spend. So they may go the route of a camera lens with a DSLR and there's nothing wrong with that. You can still take some great pictures uh, with something like that and it can something that can last you for years and of course you have a little bit of more flexibility you can change the lenses and you can do you know milky way shots wide field and then you can put on a bigger lens if you have one and, and try to zoom in and get more focal length and shoot you know some smaller but fairly bright targets out there mostly probably in the summer skies now, the issue is, though, when you start going into more focal length, the mount becomes a bigger issue. With something like a camera lens, obviously, or a red cat, um, you're good with just a tripod, a star tracker like you see here, and a DSLR. The problem is, when you start going into something even this big, this is my Explore Scientific ED-102. I've talked about this. I have a review video on it. Beautiful scope, carbon fiber. Uh, still considered wide field. Definitely not a, a large telescope. Um, but you are starting to get into the size and weight where the mount becomes an issue. And that's where I think that you really need to make up your mind as to how much you want to spend to start. If you think that you can get into a, you know, equatorial mount, astrophotography mount to begin with, and you can spend that, usually they start around $1,500. Hopefully you can find a used one, but brand new, you're going to spend somewhere around $1,500 for a mount to start with. And already, you know, that's a good chunk of change without buying the telescope, the camera, and, and all that. So that's where something like this would, I think it's sort of, to call a beginner, I think would be a bit of a stretch. Now, the other option is, I couldn't fit it here, but my Sharp Star 76 millimeter. I talk about this telescope all the time. I just took a picture with it, the Rosette, which I thought came out really nice. I was very happy with it. I love that telescope. I still use it quite a bit, depending on the target I'm shooting. And again, you're going to spend a little bit more than the Red Cat, but not as much as this. And you get sort of a nice um, middle ground of focal length. So here we're talking in the Red Cat 250 millimeters. In the Explore Scientific, I forget, somewhere around five to 600, depending if you use a reducer. With the Sharp Star 76 millimeter, it's with a reducer 349 millimeters. I think without it, it's around 414. So that's a good size. It's, it's again, you're not going to be going after galaxies. Now you've seen many of my videos where I did, and maybe you had a bit of a chuckle for those who've been doing astrophotography for some time. But it, my whole point in showing those is that, yeah, you're not going to win an APOD, you know, that's a prestigious award for uh, the best picture of the day around the world for astrophotography. But, um, you know, it's still amazing to be able to take pictures of galaxies and, and show it to your friends and, you know, impress them with it. So 
The point is that you have the option to do it. It's just not best suited, but it's a great all around telescope where you can sort of do both, uh, you know, smaller targets and of course, large summer targets and still get a decent result to an absolutely fabulous result where you definitely could win an APOD if you're able to soak enough time and if your processing skills are up to the challenge. So I think in my opinion, that's a great telescope to start with, the Sharp Star 76 millimeter. But again, you're spending a little bit more money. The weight is always a bit of an issue. It's pushing, I think it's about seven pounds, seven something. With the reducer, maybe closer to eight. So it is an issue. I've been doing it for you know a year and a half now, but with a simple setup like this, we're talking a good quality tripod, a star tracker. I even have a, an upgraded base for the star tracker, which helps with stability. You know, you're still really pushing the weight of that star tracker. And so you're not gonna be able to do long exposures. So just keep that in mind. So as, as opposed to with the Red Cat, you know, if you get a balance right and a good polar alignment, you should be able to do two minute exposures. Um, you know, it may be hit and miss depending where you're aiming in the sky. My particular star tracker is quite picky. It does not like the south for some reason. I struggle getting longer exposures in the south and in other parts of the sky as well. So that might be unique to this particular model, but uh, which is the Star Adventure by Skywatcher. But yeah, you know that you're not going to do long exposures. So the more weight you put on it, the, the less time you're probably going to be able to shoot as far as individual exposures. Now there is another option because let's be honest, astrophotography is not just shooting nebulae. That can involve planetary. Um, and planetary is an amazing aspect of this hobby that I haven't really gotten into. I've dipped my toes into it. Um, you know, this is way back when I first started. So I, I'm really looking forward to doing more of that this summer when the planets uh, make their return again. And that's where something like the Red Cat really isn't going to shine. It's not what it's designed to do. Uh, you could shoot the moon with it and get some great results. You could aim it at Saturn and it'll show, maybe even show the moons, it probably will, but you're not gonna get a lot of details, let's be honest. So they're not really suited for that. This this um, Explore Scientific, again, this will do it, has gr uh, beautiful glass, quality glass. It gives you beautiful views, very crisp. That's the advantage of a refractor. But we're still only at 500, 600 millimeters of focal length. Again, you're not gonna get crazy details. Um, I wouldn't say that it's suited particularly to planetary. That's where something like this comes into play. Now, I've never shown this. This is not actually mine, but this is the uh, Celestron Next Star 6SE. They make an 8SE, which I actually owned at one point before I actually started doing uh, astrophotography specifically. But this is the smaller version. This is still about 1,500 millimeters of focal length. Now, that's a lot. I mean, uh, you're talking three times this uh, and, you know, over five times the Red Cat. So, you're getting some pretty nice views of distant objects if you have the right sky conditions. And so for planetary and someone just starting out, this is a great telescope. And, um, you know, it's, like I said, it's got the focal length and decent views. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to give you the, 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 the views of a high quality refractor like this, but you'll still get decent views and you'll find that your uh, pictures can be quite nice, even of just a couple minutes, a couple seconds, even really, of one of those planets out there <clears throat> and even the moon of course as well the difference is though with something like this is that if you buy it with the um the mount that comes with it the money wise it's quite good in fact it's almost the same i'm sure they've gone up now with covid and i haven't checked the prices if i'm being honest but you're looking at around the same price as just the red cat on its own so you're getting a telescope with a lot of focal length and a mount so you may think, well, that's, you know, the obvious choice, but there are some things to consider. This comes with an alt as mount. Now, as opposed to say, like, um, even, even my uh, star tracker, they follow the sky on that sort of circular, um, uh, angle that it, that, that follows the sky. These, these, uh, objects in the sky don't just go from left to right and up and down. They follow sort of a curvature and that's what an equatorial mount is meant to do. It follows that angle. And that way it can follow in the target all through the night and keep it dead center. The difference with an alt as mount is that they do not follow that uh, kind of movement. They have simply a, to keep it simple, a left to right and up and down movement. So what that means is for planetary, it's fine. For planetary, you're not following a target for hours on end. You're taking very, the quickest photos possible and you're taking thousands of them ideally. And all of it's done within, you know, 
five minutes, maybe even less. I mean, those who are really good at planetary, they can do things for over an hour, you know, and just sort out the worst pictures and, and come up with a real amazing picture. But for those starting out, you're probably going to just to get a decent picture. All you need to do is be able to track an object like Jupiter for say two to three minutes, maybe even less, and you'll get yourself a pretty good image because you're taking thousands of images. Then you throw in the software and it throws out all the bad ones, takes the very best ones, stacks them up, and you get a pretty good image of that planet. And with this kind of focal length, you'll have the magnification to see some nice details on Jupiter or Mars or you know even Saturn. So that's what it's good for. What it's not good for is astrophotography. Uh, when it comes to say planet, uh, sorry, nebula and you know galaxies, because as we know with astrophotography, the idea is to take as long as an exposure as possible and as many of them as possible. So in order to do that, you need to be tracking that object as accurately as possible. Because if you're not, it's going to start to move in your field of view, and then you're going to get something I think it's called uh, image rotation, where or image shift, where you know, it starts in the middle, but as you go that, you know, the uh, nebula starts to move and then, you know, because your mount's not following the curvature, that target now is starting to move in the field of view and it's going to show in your picture. So you're not able to track for, you know, four or five hours with a mount like this. You're going to be stuck to shorter exposures, probably. I've never done it, but I think somewhere around um, 30 seconds or, or less. Maybe there are some that can push it for more than that, but for your average person starting out, you might get 30 second exposures, maybe a minute, and you're not gonna be able to track it without adjusting it again. And that's a bit of a pain and can, you know, introduce a lot of problems when it comes to stacking your images. So this kind of mount and alt as is great for planetary, but not so good for astrophotography. So that's sort of where you gotta make a decision. If you know that you love doing visual, you would be more than happy to do planetary, and it would be a bonus, say, to do some nebulae, maybe, uh, or bigger galaxies like Andromeda. This could be a great option because, again, you're not spending a, a whole lot up front. Um, you're getting a lot of focal length and a, a pretty good overall telescope that can do a little bit of everything, although not ideally. That's the thing with astrophotography. <laughs> there's a lot of equipment out there. Most of it is more specialized. That's why there's so many telescopes. That's why I own so many telescopes, different mounts. They all serve a different purpose. And for the best results, or at least that you want to get, try to get, it's good to have the right equipment to do that. Um, there is other options that will be better for astrophotography and planetary. An example is my Edge HD. That's, I've talked about that telescope. I haven't used it a whole lot, if I'm being honest. Here it is here. I've done an introductory video on it, but there's lots of videos on YouTube on it. They're a lot like this uh, 6SE, but they're more made for, they have a flat field and they're more made for astrophotography. But again, you still need a mount, a proper mount to do astrophotography with it. So you're running into the same problem and you're adding even more weight than this 6SE. This is not light. I mean, it's not super heavy, but it's not, you know, it's definitely heavier than, you're not going to put it on a star tracker. Let's put it that way. Um, so weight is an issue and you're just going to be spending a lot more money on an Edge HD, which does planetary and um, astrophotography, you know, nebulae and all that um, equally well, you could almost say. But for this, this is an option. So like I mentioned, if you like, if you love observing and that's maybe your favorite thing to do, or you love doing planetary and you can't afford an even bigger scope, this is a great option. I do like the scope. It's, you know, it doesn't, it's not the, the best quality or anything, but it does everything well. And that's, you know, that's all you can say for whatever they cost now. I think they may be up to like $1,300, including the mount, which in astrophotography terms is cheap. I know that sounds crazy, but that's just the way it is. So this is a great option. Otherwise, as I mentioned, if you want to go the other way, you can just use a camera lens and you maybe already have a couple lenses that you can use. And there you're going to focus more on like landscape, Milky Way, and some of the bigger targets out there, but you can shoot nebulae no problem with a good size camera lens and still get great results. So there's a lot of options out there. I think it matters most to give it some time, do some research. Um, if you have a DSLR and you have some of the basic equipment, maybe start with that and see before you start spending money on this. But if you know that you love to observe and you're always going to love to observe and you love doing planetary or would love to try doing planetary because you love um, viewing the planets, then this might be a good way to go to get started. 
it all depends on your funds, obviously. If, if you only have a certain amount and you know that's going to be all you can spend for the next five years, then you really need to put some thought into it and think about what what's going to keep me satisfied for those five years. Is it going to be good enough to do planets and, you know, very short exposures on nebulae? Or, you know what, never mind the planets. I want to focus on nebulae and shoot some large galaxies and maybe go with something like this or my sharp star 76 millimeter and just put it on a simple, you know, tripod, star tracker, super light, not too expensive and, and go that route. But there's, there's definitely options. That's the nice thing. And, you know, it just is something you really got to think about and kind of decide where you want to go. I do find that I, I knew that a nebula would sort of be my, um, my thing because I just love them. They're so beautiful and there's so many out there of them, different kinds. So my focus is always on refractors. I love refractors. They give great views and, um, you know, they're not so large and that you need like really heavy duty uh, mounts. My Optron that I've talked about many times will be more than enough to hold me for, for many years, unless I go out and get a honking refractor down the road, but I don't think that's going to happen. No, you never know with me, but, um, they're just great and you can throw them, you can take some, a setup like this with you, you can go out to a dark sky and it's really nice. Something like this, it's surprisingly light as well. I have to say, I, I don't, uh, I didn't take it apart when I brought it here. I, you know, left it together. You can pick it up, take it down the stairs and they're not too heavy. Um, it looks bigger than the weight. So that's what's nice about that too. But again, ideally if you can have, if you love to do both and you can have both, that's great. But realistically for people, some people, that's just not an option. That's understandable, of course. And so that's where you need to make a decision. But if I could do both something like this Red Cat and a telescope like this, I mean, the Edge HD is even better, but this does, I've viewed many times out of this telescope. It's, you know, still gives you amazing views of the planets. And I've never used this particular model for planetary, but as I mentioned, I, I use the eight inch version of an older model of this. And, uh, you know, for my first time, here's the picture here. I put, I just stitched all three together. Obviously this is not all three planets lined up. You know, it's not bad. Uh, it's not great by any means, but for my first time I was happy. And I know that next time I go out, I'll improve on that. But I hope this helps guys. There is no answer. Let's just be honest. Everyone is different. Everyone has different budgets, different preferences, but I hope this helps give you sort of a rundown of looking back. If I had to do it all over again, I think I would sort of stay with what I did. I was happy with it. I still love this telescope. So it's not like I outgrew it or anything like that. It's still a great telescope for the right circumstances. Um, I just use it on, on, on Andromeda in the summer and it took a great photo that I was very happy with. So I'll never get rid of this. It still serves its purpose, which is nice to know, you know, two, almost two years in that uh, I still feel that I'll keep this forever. And uh, I was glad that I made that purchase at the time. So I hope that helps guys. Thanks so much. I got more gear coming. This is on its way out, uh, sadly, um, but it will be replaced by something exciting. So I'm going to leave you with that cliffhanger. I hope to be able to show that to you soon, but until next time, thanks so much guys. See you on the next one.